Welcome to The Problem, a Lockwood & Co. podcast. I'm Caitlin. I'm Alan. And this week we are talking about part one of The Screaming Staircase by Jonathan Stroud, which was published in 2013. Part one, titled Ghosts, includes the first four chapters. In chapter one, Lucy Carlyle and Anthony Lockwood begin their inspection of a haunted house in London. I gave Anthony his name in the British accent that first time, and I'm not sure what happened there. Yeah. But I guess I've just watched the show too much. Let's never say his first <laughs> name again so I don't have to deal with that crisis. Yeah, when I wrote out that sentence, I was like, should I just put Lockwood? We don't, but I guess we're introducing the characters, so. There's a whole thing in the versions of the book that I have where you would say Anthony or Anthony because there's like replacements of biscuits for cookies. Oh, and... that's in my copy too. I was so so yeah. previous to this. Should we give the other chapter summaries before I start my rant? No, 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 no. We'll go because you notice it right away in chapter one, I think. So it's oh. worth talking about. Okay, we can so... skip around. Don't worry about it. You'd be like, okay, and okay, later okay, okay. there's an even worse one. <laughs> I wasn't sure what our. I guess we should say, no rant first. <laughs> <laughs> um. So previous to us podcasting about the books i have only listened to the audiobooks i have not physically read them so i didn't realize Me too. about yeah. the temperature changes because the audiobooks are just the british ones but i was yeah. reading this and thought it gave me the fucking fahrenheit and i'm like uh why does canada have to be attached to america <sighs> <laughs> so that's interesting this was something that i was wondering because like why would they change it for Canada, I I guess you just get the North American release. Yeah, we release just get the and... same printing as nine times out of ten. Uh, when a yeah. book is published in Canada, they just, it, it's this exact same, like, it is printed with the American books. That's why when you go into a bookstore, a lot of the books will have the American price and the Canadian price. Because they're all just printed uh -huh. at the same time. Oh, true, true, true. Right? right. How the actual rights work I'm not 100% sure on because we do have Canadian branches of the like the big publishing companies and that sort of thing but they must mm -hmm. have they must have it set up like I'm sure they've done it 100 times. A very occasionally we will get like the equivalent of the British uh the, like the British publishing. I can only think of two book series that I have read where that was the case. But don't say them. Like, leave everyone in the Okay, so one of them I don't remember. It was just like a four-book <laughs> series that I read like five to ten years ago that I enjoyed at the time. I remember maybe like a girl died and, and, and then she would wake up in a different body. I don't remember what it was called. Uh, the other one was oh, Harry Potter. Cool. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I don't know if... I wonder... Uh, I, I don't think that they're that... They're not as British as these books, I feel like. I know, I know that might be weird to say that Harry Potter is less British, but I, I just feel like these books are like, like they break for tea and stuff. And, and they're so situated in a real London with like right, yeah. vernacular that's very British. Yeah. That, yeah. I, I feel like Harry Potter is more like Fantasy. universal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More fantastical. It's in its own world for sure. Yeah, I'm sure that there's a lot of. I don't know how much time I want to spend talking about fucking Harry Potter, but uh, like, I'm sure there's a lot of British culture in there that we just don't pick up on. You know what sure. I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm sure they do feel very British, especially since I know that there was, like, there are things that n North American folks would think was fantasy world building, but actually, no, that was just England. It's just England. <laughs> <laughs> yeah they do have cars that fly that's true mm. um yeah so th that was something that i really noticed when right away when in chapter one that there's all kinds of little changes like that um between because i also only listened to the audiobooks and then when i was going through i have the ebook version is what i'm using and it's um it's north american redacted version <laughs> of i don't even know how i would get my hands on an ebook in the original British English, the King's English. 
<laughs> oh man, I was just gonna say something about the Queen's England, but no, it isn't the fucking King's no. English. Jesus. That's right. <clears throat> Shall we dive into chapter one then? Yeah. I will mention that I have decided not to type out any notes for myself. I've just written notes in the physical book and I'm going to be flipping through. This is an experiment. I don't know if this is going to work or if I'm just going to be a mess. But um, <laughs> yeah, we'll see how it that's goes. That's what I did too. Because like, uh, that's what I always do. Um, I re- This is why I really like ebooks because you can just highlight a part of the text and then you can write like an entire essay in the notes and it does it doesn't show up in the book I'll see but it. you can like click it right and then it's like there i just have transparent post-it notes because i can't stand the idea of actually writing on my books especially since i had to buy well i had to like specifically find the hard covers for these books that i didn't get the ugly netflix sticker on them yeah good and I know previously somebody has recommended, um, like somebody designed stickers to go over them, but that would still piss me off. I would still know it was there. <laughs> I would still know. You'd want to cut it out of I, the cover. <laughs> it's it's not even like as much as Netflix, you know, canceled the show and we're angry about that. It's not even about that. I refuse to buy the permanent sticker books ever. I do not own a yeah, single I, one. I agree. I never I will. It. I don't do it. I will not support that stupid practice. Yeah, I don't I don't like it at all either. I also could not write in a book that feels uh dark sided to me. That's evil. I I can't do that. I, I've done it one time and it was on like a book that I'd picked up a second copy of from a like a from a not a used bookstore, but a thrift store is where I'm going. Yeah. It was it was the Amber Spyglass actually for our other podcast. Um so yeah, more on having previously read the audiobooks, I didn't realize there was chapter art. Uh, yeah, so it says in the um, copyright and stuff that all of the illustrations are from Kate Adams. Hmm. Yeah, and they have a nice little picture at the beginning of uh, each chapter. And there's a little bit of like fancy font for each chapter as well. Oh, I is there? Yeah, it's like the, the parts, each part has a title and then oh, the, the chapter title page. Yes. has a, has a, yeah, but the chapter itself, this is like chapter one, but the letters of the chapter, yes. at least in my version, are are all like kind of funny looking. Yes, cool yes, looking. they are. Yeah, I like that. I like that kind of stuff. So I really like uh, Jonathan Stroud's like whole um, word choice and like his entire kind of, I guess, uh, style is is really what I mean like w- word style the way that he the kind of verbs that he uses to talk about the setting and things like that i just highlighted lots of different things throughout all the chapters that are just like him using really punchy language that um from the first time that i listened to the book you were like we should do a podcast and so i checked out the book before i watched the show and immediately in this first chapter i was like oh man i love the word choices that this guy builds the world with. Um, For example, he has uh, like in one part of the chapter here, he it says the porch had a forlorn and unused air. It's corners choked with the same sodden beech leaves that littered the path and lawn. So like stuff like choked, Mm -hmm. the corners are choked um, and the beech leaves littered. Uh, stuff like that just like infuses the world with a certain kind of emotion and tone that is kind of effortless. Like it's doing multiple kinds of work at the same time. You're not just getting the scene by itself. You're getting like how the scene feels. Yes. I can't find it now, but I wrote a note about a later bit here where he's describing a smell, but then he says it tasted like such and such. And I thought that that was such an interesting choice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I have it. That's, I can't yeah, find it in here. When she's in the office. Yeah, but it's yeah. somewhere in here. I also love because he tells us that like the house has only been empty for like two days. So yeah. it's interesting that he's already describing it as though it's this long forgotten thing. Right. That's how it feels. Yeah. Right. Or that's how he wants us to feel about yeah. it. Yeah. Even, even though he says, like, mm, she's only been gone for two days. Everything should still feel pretty lived in, you know? Mm-hmm. But maybe 
the ghost makes things feel different. Right. And that, yeah, I think that's a sense that he's trying to communicate to the reader. I think it's also just his style. He probably, like, I don't want to make it sound like he's belabored, you know, with like a, a dictionary and the sort, although maybe he is, I don't know anything about his method, but it seems to me like he's using like very punchy kind of words and constructing sentences that have a lot of energy to them because the the he's ascribing verbs to nouns that don't usually have those verbs associate with them like darkness doesn't choke things you know right, what i mean yeah. like that's not a quality that it possesses but he grants it that quality in the language and it creates an atmosphere yeah i agree it's wonderful speaking of atmosphere I also really love, just in this opening paragraph, which is almost, it's almost all one line or one sentence, you get the humor and the horror right away. You know, it's, oh, it's, point, yeah. it's gruesome, but because we're so very much in this like 15 year old girl's voice, it's also just like, well, we messed up these jobs kind of a lot and we're not going to talk about <laughs> that. <laughs> but like, yeah. there's one thing where like a ghost is going to haunt a woman forever, literally. like. What? That's terrible. And they're like, eh, we're just not talking about that. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, I also really liked that first sentence the first time that I listened to the book because it told me right away that we're not going to start with the very first case. Yeah. And with Lucy, like, knowing nothing and, like, we're going to learn along with Lucy. I was just like, oh, we're hitting the ground running. Our characters already know what they're doing. And it expects you to keep up. I was like, great. This is great. But also in the way that he's in the stylistic way that he has Lucy talking to us, she will just stop and explain things to us. But it doesn't feel forced. It just feels mm -hmm, like, and here mm -hmm. I am sharing this with you. Like this whole first, these most of my notes for these first four chapters are just, oh, world building. Oh, world building. Oh, like it's all world building. But if you're just reading it, it doesn't feel like it's being shoved down your throat. Yeah, yeah. Also, as an aside, on the first page here, there is just the words, The Creeping Shadow, which is the name of a later book, I, obviously. And I thought I that know. was fun. I'm sure it's an accident. I'm sure I wasn't planning that far <laughs> out, but it was fun to notice it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I thought that when I was reading it this time, I was like, oh, that can't be the same thing. Yeah, it's not. Oh, because you haven't read yeah. book four yet, right? No, I haven't read the creeping shadow yet i've read the first three books now so. okay good to know for me not being yeah, like right. this is obviously this blah 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 blah. yep and we get a lot of uh back and forth with lucy and lockwood that kind of like uh establishes their rapport and how they work with each other it's good stuff but different like the opening scene in the show did the same thing but it's very different in the book they swap around some of their dialogue, that sort of thing. And the show completely cut out how ridiculous Lockwood is. <laughs> like, totally. The yeah. stuff with the accents and him being like, oh, but it's fun. Like, and I wrote down that the show makes Lockwood sort of desperate to appear an adult, while the book makes it seem like he's clinging to his youth. And it's interesting because it's the same issue but they show it in two different ways. Oh, yeah, I like that. Yeah, for sure. He's he's pretty different. Uh, it feels to me like Lucy wrangles him a lot more than she ever would in the show. Yep. Like she the first thing that she says to him is basically like, don't do this, don't do that. And he's like, that's an awful lot of don'ts. Like, <laughs> it's like, who's the boss here? You know, the childish boss. <laughs> right. Well, I think that is kind of what Stroud is communicating. Like, we should be asking ourselves that as readers. Like, yes. who's the boss? I thought this is Lockwood and Co., but Lucy is the eye of the book. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. And seems and so, a little like, in everything charge is here. A little, yeah, 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 yeah. Who's the important one, too? You know, like, there's a lot of, like, I think that gives the book some energy because it's like, oh, this isn't, all of this is not quite what I expected, which is good. Um, and then they have a quick conversation about a dead mouse, which you think, why in the world is that there? But it's just really good world building. Yeah, I forgot about this, that 
he can even <clears throat> see the deaths of um, non-humans. Yeah, like walking around must be terrible for him. Yeah, it's got to be awful. It's really weird, too, because I was like, well, then are there ghosts of animals? I don't remember any examples of that. Yeah, I don't either. You know, like, we murder a lot of animals, if you think of it as murder. <laughs> but I don't know. I would think, I am I mean, that's sort of, I think, philosophical question. Like, do animals have souls? Do they yeah, yeah, yeah. go to the same place humans do after they die? Because if the answer is... I don't think Stroud's worried about that. The, well, I don't think he's worried about that, but when you learn about how the problem exists and blah, blah, blah later on, that's kind of the answer you would need to know whether or not animal ghosts are around. Yeah. It just doesn't come up. Uh, so then we meet not Mrs. Hope. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think that's a little bit, I don't know, like unnecessarily complicated. I can understand, I guess it, it provides like a slight escalation to be like, things are even worse than they were a couple of days ago when we talked to you. Mm. And should tip us off that more is happening here than the owner knows. But um, I don't know. Like, the more characters you give me, the more I'll be like, ah, I don't know who's who. I assumed that this was more about to make it so that they only had this one night to do the job. Because while Mrs. Hope hired them, this lady is obviously like, I don't trust these kids. Oh, that's a good point. So it escalates in that way, too. Yeah. yeah. But it, it does seem like they could have had the exact same scene with just one person. Like, there, there didn't have to be two people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because she could still be like, and I think that's what happened in the show. She could still just be like, you guys are too young. What's going on? Um, but they cut out the whole, we only have this one night to do it thing in the show. And it's it's the con it's the conversation with this lady that they that the show kind of switched their lines around a bunch, which I just think is an interesting choice. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. You know, in the show, Lucy doesn't have the same personality a lot of times, but that is like one of the moments where her personality is kind of like adults are are worthless. Um, yeah, and most of her, I feel like most of her personality in the book comes from her narrative voice, which is like the unvoiced part of her. Yeah. A lot of times she's like, oh, I, I would really like to punch that person in the face, but that's not what she says out loud. And so like her being rude in the opening moment feels in character, if you know the character from the book. Yes. I also love how in the book, like everyone talks about her. This is maybe the later books. So maybe I should say this, but everyone talks about her being, oh, Lockwood does bring it up here, being like sensitive and open to things. But if you're in her brain, she's just like, I hate everyone. I don't care about their feelings. <laughs> yeah. Which is probably like a self-defense. Oh, against yeah, absolutely. Sensitivity. Absolutely. Yeah. But I love that about her. Everyone is just like, yeah. you have to be careful. You feel too much. And she's just like, feelings. God, they're the worst. Yeah. I feel angry. That's what I feel. Yeah. I feel like the rest of the first chapter is just world building couched in conversation. It, you, we get a lot of information about what you do in a haunted house, what Lockwood and Lucy, you know, the listening, the seeing, how everything goes. You know, we get the, the bit about the threshold um, and we get Lucy's first like listening in and she hears the knocking. It's it's there's not much to talk about, but it's good. It's good writing. Yeah, there. There is an important moment that he calls back to later in the book, of course, where they first walk through the door. Yeah. You know, after the, they decide to go in and everything. And they walk right through, but the narrative kind of pauses to be like, you have to walk in, you have to be bold, you can't hesitate, mm -hmm. um, and all this stuff, because that uh, comes back later in the book. But it also, like you said, it's world building and sets a tone for how ghosts in this world operate, that they feed off of emotion <clears throat> and they're like sensitive. The ghosts are the really the sensitive ones yeah. to like how the kids are feeling and stuff. And it also sets up that they aren't, they aren't here to be scared. You know, they're here to do a job. This is business for them. Yeah. Also, I did just want to mention the, the thing where Mr. Hope falls down the stairs or, or Lucy re-experiences it. For written word, it's a pretty good jump scare because jump scares don't yeah. really work in writing, but eh, it was decent. Oh, it's really, really good. Yeah. yeah. And then chapter and chapter one ends oh, with them yeah, there breaking for tea, which I love because 
it again, it just makes it feel like a job. How they're like, okay, well, we've done some work and now we're going to have a tea break. And it's very British also. Yeah. Um, like you said before, I just feel like that's a choice that Jonathan Stroud is making to be like unapologetically like London and cultural and like situated in its own self in a way that's like, I'm not going to try and like write something that is like broadly for the English speaking world, right? It's like very, very situated in London. It's very specific and idiosyncratic, which is really awesome. I think it's like one of the best things about the series. I agree. And it's a shame that the American editions took some of that out. Yeah, I, I want, I guess I, it's just like a matter of assuming that children would be confused by it. There's a thousand little ways that it's different. There's an, there was even like a part where Lucy says like to right and they changed that. And, uh, and I was like, wow, you know, like kids in America are just idiots, I guess. They just would not be able to figure out what she means by that. Or they, or it's like they think that children can't be worldly. Yeah. Yeah. Even though like this was published after Harry Potter, as we've discussed, like, and I think that that and, you know, the internet did a good job with introducing children to these different like dialects and cultural stuff, cultural stuff. That was yeah. smart of me. You know what I'm saying, though? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's a thing that I think now more than ever, like readers are actually looking for. They they want different cultures. They don't want some kind of like pan world, you know, like globalist version of something. They want something like highly culturally specific. Yeah. And, and he's just, that's a choice he made to write it that way, which yeah. I think is great. So then in chapter two, we get a bunch more world building about how these haunting jobs usually go or haunted house jobs, I guess I should say. And we also get our first yeah. mention of George. My, uh, my little chapter two summary says in chapter two, Lucy and Lockwood search the house for the source of the haunting and narrow it down to the deceased owner's office. Right. I forgot about our summaries. It's all right. I made it sound very natural. <laughs> yeah. There's even the picture for chapter two is even uh, the cup tea. of tea um, with cookies. <laughs> <laughs> like the word cookie. That's just, what it says in the text. I know. It just doesn't have the same. It's just different. It's a different feel, you know? Yeah. I feel like even the drawing, I wonder if the drawings are different in the British version, because I just feel like that isn't... Oh, that it wouldn't... It wouldn't that it would that be just, like an, a, a different assortment? Yeah, like that looks like a chocolate chip cookie. It doesn't look like a British oh, biscuit, yeah. you know? That would be really crazy to me if they went that far. They were like, they won't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much that they won't understand, just like it was a different artistic choice. Like, I don't know if the British books have the art at the beginning. Right. That might be an American book only thing. Oh, true. Yeah. True, true. Um, oh, OK. Yeah. My note here is, is about this exact cookie biscuit situation. <laughs> We're never going to let this go. I know. I know. There was another part here early on where where I was like, oh, this is another this is another really good example of his whole thing where it says the night presses in around you and the silence beats against your ears. And I was just like, oh, man, silence beating against your ears and night pressing in on you. Like silence and night are both like an absence of other things. But like the way that he evokes them is as if they are like their own thing. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like like darkness is the absence of light. But that's but the way he's constructing it is like darkness has its own presence and agency. Uh, and silence is not like a lack of sound. It's like some kind of ontological presence with its own ability to like assault you the way that sound would so it's just like little choices like that i think just like build a mood in a in a place and then he's usually it's like you said earlier too with with the uh humor he'll like usually do something like that and it has like a joke kind of right next to it because like the line before it says it's never pleasant sitting in a haunted house waiting in the dark mm -hmm. Which is kind of like a ho hum sentence, but when you set it off against the night presses in around you and silence beats against your ears, I don't know. Like, there's like a contrast there to me that like punches up the second sentence and is almost makes the first sentence a little absurd in like a good way. I don't know. 
he's the, he's really talented writer i think it's it's like he said you know 10 books published oh ten, yeah he does what he can. five six yeah ten ten <laughs> ten i do love so like i said we get a brief mention of george here that george has comics lockwood likes to read his gossip magazines and lucy you know does some drawing which is an interesting thing that they completely cut out of the show mm-hmm but what I really like is that in the middle of all this like haunted house setup, they have this little like safe space in the kitchen. And it's interesting that it's the kitchen because the kitchen in 35 Portland Road becomes such a major set and such a like oh, yeah. homey set. So it's interesting that they set up a kitchen in the haunted house to sort of emulate that same feeling. I feel like like kitchens to them feel safe. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, that it's like a little piece of home, yeah. It would be interesting to see what a different agency might do if they like to set up their safe space somewhere else. I wonder, now that you say that, I wonder if other agencies would even do something. Hmm. If there wouldn't just be a kind of task, you know, mastering of like the adults are like set up outside and they're just like go in there and like do the job. And there's none of this like, we're taking a break, we're reassessing, we're... I feel like I feel like this wouldn't happen with other agencies. Right, yeah. I've never really thought about that though. Me yeah, no, me neither, not until here. Um and then we just get Lucy talking about some of their equipment, but she throws in this line about a girl at Rotwalls that had died. <laughs> Which is great because we're about to find out that Lockwood forgot some of their equipment and <laughs> <laughs> and it's but it's just like thrown in there and it's just so like like a like the kids die all the time. It's just part of the job. Yeah, for sure. I think it's really deaf because it is like so light. When I've been talking about like, you know, like the darkness and the silence have their own agency. And then she's like, a human being died yeah. the other day. But um, anyway. Yeah, that's why you got to pack like, your bag, And like that's a choice right? too. Yeah. So then, I don't know, they just sort of continue talking about the information they've got. And they have this brief moment where they mention that the problem possibly started in Kent. And I, yeah. didn't, I didn't remember this line, and I do not remember at all if that comes back. This was one of the things that I noticed the first time that I read it, and I was like, like, oh, that's an important piece of lore. Like, that stuck out to me, and I've always had that tucked in the back of my mind. But I've never seen it come up again in the, in the three books or the show. I don't think it's in the show at all. I do it's like not. how... It's like debatable, though, between them. And the, and it's the kind of thing that they talk about. It's like kind of shop talk. Yeah. To be like, is there even a problem in Kent? Oh, actually, the problem is worse than this person's making it out to be. And there's like an element of that. We might not be communicating the actual like that's the source. But we are communicating that like this is something that people can debate in this world like it's not everything is not known perfectly even to the degree of like is there a problem in kent as bad as it is in london like that's even something that's debatable in this world so like that in itself is information i feel like it couldn't be just because of how many people and therefore how many deaths are in london yeah but it, it's interesting to think well we also don't know like is it a worldwide thing we talked about that with the show. I feel like in the show, it almost has to be because the level of technology for the entire world has seemed to like be affected in a way that the books just don't try to deal with that very much. And so like, why would that happen if it was only happening in one spot? It's not like, you know, England or London specifically is like the birthplace of lots of digital technology. Like that right, doesn't yeah. make sense. So it would have to be kind of a problem everywhere in the show you know alan i really wish you would finish the books <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i know but i think that's part of like i don't know that's part of to me the, like how the show should work is that one of us should know everything and can say no dumb, no i, ironic I things. do agree i do agree I, but there are times like right now when i just really want to dive into but would it have affected the other rest of the world when blah 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 yeah 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 i get it i guess we'll get there someday um, um, my, my next note is just, wow, Book Lockwood never shuts up. <laughs> I, I don't necessarily mean that in a bad way, but dude just goes talking and talking and talking. I feel like he always has a story. He always has something to say. It's interesting. Yeah. He's like, did I ever tell you about the time? And she's like, yes, a million times. I've yep. heard this story so many times. Oh my God. Which is a good dynamic. 
Yeah. Especially since she's still relatively new with the agency. <laughs> it's like you said, he's just always going on and on and on. Uh, and then we get receptionist George, who of course, but we, but like, obviously he's not the receptionist because we get that like, oh, he won't like that. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote that down too. Oh. It's an indirect introduction. It's conversational. So like, that's really deft again. That's really good writing. I think that there is somebody named George, that he is not the receptionist, that he is, you know, like that would be an affront to him and, and all of this kind of stuff. So. I always like, I think that's so smart. I'm always scared whenever I write to do this thing that I, I think is so smart. When you do what I think of as a negative introduction, when you say like a character, you've not met the character, but you're like, the character is not da 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 Like right. George is not the receptionist. He is not the this and that. And well, and just before that, we get them talking about George's theories on the problem. So we even get mm -hmm. a little bit of... Yeah. And he reads comic books. Yeah, his main personality there, his theory. Yeah, uh, yeah. On the next page, I did circle the 48 degrees and write down stupid U.S. publishing. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that too. It's, um, it's, although my feeling was a little bit the opposite. I was like, oh, that's what that means. <laughs> I have no idea. Because I am a dumb American. I mean, that being said, again, because of this whole Canada being connected to America thing, the thermostat in my house is in Fahrenheit, so... I do somewhat understand Fahrenheit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That whole thing is silly. My, yeah, my kids are old enough now that they're asking me, like, why do we do that? And everyone else, and it's like, there's no, there's no good answer to this. I think question. it's just stubbornness, which is fair. Yeah, a lot is. of countries are stubborn about things, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, well, we had to show, we had to show our dad that we are grown up and we're not part of his house anymore. And right. so we choose to, it's an emo thing. We really committed to it. Uh, in the part that you were talking about where Lockwood is, or I guess I was talking about it, where Lockwood goes on and on and on, and Lucy's like, yeah, I heard that a million times. There was this part that I highlighted where he says, um, he says, oh, well, the point is, Mr. Hope could be coming back for a host of other reasons that aren't to do with vengeance. Something left undone, for instance, a will he didn't tell his wife about, or a stash of money hidden under the bed, mm. which I thought was interesting because it's like, Everything doesn't have to be about murder. Like ghosts could come back for any number of reasons and the and they ghosts do come back for reasons. Like that's an important thing to know. Yeah. They're not just this isn't just random stuff happening. There is like murder is a common reason, but it's not the only one. And the reason is tied to the source, which is also an important thing to know. Mm -hmm. And so it's worth investigating the motives of the ghost because it can tell you like something about oh the source is the will or the you know what i mean right like, in this case that he's that he's positing which is interesting because later on i noted a bit where lockwood says i'm never gonna find it says something like if it's a type two like a type two always means something bad has happened either to them or they did something bad and i'm mm -hmm. i find that interesting because i don't think we ever really revisit it but I want to know if that's true, if every single type two, you know, right, was, right, was right, there right. ever yeah. an anomaly to that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, yeah, that also stuck out to me. And I was like, then what makes a type three? It's also interesting that they start, like the first time we ever hear about types is a type two. And so that's also another really good little move where you've already said, like, there's more than one type of ghost. Yeah. And probably there's more than two you know? Yep. Um, so you're like communicating a lot of information there with just that one little move. Another bit where I wish you'd read more because we do actually get a bit about what makes a type three, but it's from the type three's perspective. So I don't like, it's just his, it's just kind of Skull's opinion on what made him him. I was going to say, yeah, those guys are really trustworthy. Well, I don't disparage Skull, you know, he's doing his <laughs> best. <laughs> Yeah, like I said, I read the third book. I'm excited to get to Skull and talk about Skull. He is really, really good. In that yeah. Book. Oh, it's literally the next page. Type two. <laughs> I just flipped right by it. Type two always means someone's done something to somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It also says that, like, the, that she sensed that Mrs. Hope, like, sensed a purpose in the ghost. Yeah. And that suggests a type two. That purpose is like tied to the type twos in some way that they're able to like psychically, you know, like 
you can feel psychically, even if you're not a child, intentions around the ghost and stuff, purposes. So that's like an important idea in the book, too. And then um, they go and do some more investigating. They go upstairs, check some stuff out. Yeah, they they talk about their little thermometer things a lot, right, yeah. uh, which is really good for narrowing down like they're homing in on oh this room's warmer this room's colder yeah so there's like a kind of science to it i guess and you just kind of like intuit he's kind of trusting that you understand like this is how it works yeah it's doing it's an interesting writing technique that he has that translated so well to the show where he doesn't just stop and explain the world to you he just puts it in the conversation or sometimes in lucy's narration and he doesn't explain everything. He'll just explain little bits and trust you to pick up on it and put it all together. Mm -hmm. It's it's good. Uh, again, I as somebody who has read a lot of middle grade books as an adult, there are some that will just completely talk down to kids. And there are some that don't. And I do prefer that those ones, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. It's very, I don't know, like the first time I read this, I was so impressed with everything that he is doing. Like it's. He trusts you and he's also being like really subtle and mm -hmm. building a mood. And it's just like, wow, he's so talented. But again, and yeah, Good job, like, you, like you just said, it does sort of feel like he trusts the reader, which is always a nice feeling as a reader. Yeah. So then they find the study that used to be a bedroom and we get the filings or chains conversation. <laughs> right. Yeah. Which is, it, it's, you know. We talked about it in the show, and it, I think that it's the same thing here. Like, it's doing double duty. It's talking to character and world building at the same time. It's also funny. And it does also just it, feel like, oh, my group project partner dropped the ball, you know? like Yeah. 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 And then at the end, the, the chapter ends with a ghost. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, oh, there was a part mm. um, that I wanted to talk about where... I think when they're closing in on it, it talks about Ghost Lock a little bit and how I really, really like this part. I think that's the beginning um, of the next chapter. Is it? When Lucy gets a little ghost locked, yeah. So it says, from the heaviness of Lockwood's voice, I knew that he too felt malaise. Oh. The strange sluggishness, that dead weight in the muscles that comes when a visitor is near. Oh, so okay. this, isn't, this isn't Ghost Lock. This is malaise. I'm sorry. Gotcha. So I misspoke. You're right. Uh, that 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 comes later but i thought that this was like uh, a lot of like world building was happening right there that there's like we talked about the intentions of the ghost but there's also like this is part of being near a ghost is it just like flattens you emotionally and starts to control you and you have to learn how to disassociate yourself from that that's like an important skill that you have yep. to have as a ghost hunter it's also an interesting play on like horror movies where people are in a haunted house and feel like like there are a lot where they, you know, start feeling differently as soon as they're there. Like just the presence of the ghost causes them to feel differently. And it's interesting that he yeah. takes those traditions, I guess, and makes them part of the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we get to like it. It also like uses the medium really well, right? Like as a book, because the best thing about a book is that you're inside the person mm -hmm. and so like this talks about a feeling that's inside it's it's something that a tv show can not do very easily so that's one of the things i really like about this world is the malaise that the ghosts make you feel and the fear and and all of that kind of stuff that you have to like there's an internal struggle to the whole thing on top of like being a good sword fighter or having your supplies ready and yeah. all of that stuff there's a psychic battle thing going on but yeah you're right the chapter ends with a ghost just in one line it, it says like there when i raised girl. my head to call lockwood yeah. i saw a girl standing there yeah uh, which is such a super strong way to end a chapter because you're like what and then in chapter three lucy is attacked by the ghost of a woman and lockwood forces the ghost to retreat into the wall of the office because i remembered the summary this time <laughs> and yes we get we get very quickly introduced to Ghost Lock, which, again, is just a good bit of world building. Because even as Lucy describes it, she's like, but I'm a professional. I know how to fight these things off. Da, da, da. Yeah. 
Nothing mattered, least of all me. Silence and stillness and utter paralysis of movement were all I could aspire to, all that I deserved. Yeah. Like, yikes. <laughs> so it's just being a teenager is really what <laughs> happens to you. The ghost makes you feel like a teenager. But Lucy doesn't know that because she still is one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's like, it's, it's just another day for me. Yeah. You can't slow me down. Uh, but like even after that, she's just like, in other words, ghost luck. I can fight this off, which is in, like because he gives it so intensely, and then is, Lucy's very nonchalant about it. Yeah, so I think that's really important that it gets named after we, the reader, have like gone through this kind of emotional experience of it. Yeah, with no explanation, it's kind of like scary and disorienting, and then she like names it and kind of dismisses it and so there's like that's a whole kind of judo motion you know happening that like i don't know i think that that is really really powerful yeah because it it makes me trust lucy as a ghost hunter and it it makes me really believe that she knows what she's doing yes and that this world is like really dangerous and yeah it gives her history without diving into the history exactly yeah that's i think that's not easy to do this is like a really good example of like you just throw an experience out there and then you name it and you have the character kind of throw it away i was like wow that's just really impressive that is like communicates so succinctly the what you want to get across um and then we have this next scene which i think is the first scene that the show did almost word for word is this the oh lockwood yeah yeah, I really like this. <laughs> I like your imitation of the audiobook narrator there. It was good. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. Um, but yeah, just the way that... And, and the, the sign, when she says it's urgent, I cannot hear that in anything other than Ruby Stokes' voice in the show. Yeah. <laughs> Even yeah, listening yeah, yeah. to the audiobook, I'm just like, no, that's wrong. It's Ruby there. Yeah. I don't know why. The way that she said it in the show is like stuck in my brain. I mean, also, we watched the show a lot, obviously, because we were podcasting, but still. Yeah. No, I agree. I And I was seeing, you know, the actors as the characters. The yeah, it's good. I, I, again, I'm not one who thinks that scenes from the book have to be, you know, word for word in a show. You know, you really just have to make a good TV show. But it is always nice when it happens. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's a really, like, it lends itself to television too because a lot of the gag is both visual and audio yeah uh and cutting in between the two of them like lockwood is like i'm a fucking detective dude like look at my big brain <laughs> and and she like has the answer in front of her yeah. and yeah it's just all really good and we get um our first ghost speaking to lucy when uh the ghost says i'm cold i'm cold yeah, yeah. Now she doesn't say that, right? In the in the show? No. Doesn't she say let go of me right away? I don't know about right away, but I think at first it was just like sounds and then when Lockwood came out, he like told her to to focus in yeah. and she does her eye close boom thing with the sound effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or not boom, but you know what I mean. The the sound effect that you liked so much. Yeah, yeah. Where everything else drops out. Yeah. That's really really smart. Yeah, I don't remember her saying I'm cold at all. And it really feels like what we're talking about here is kind of like euphemisms around being like a dead body or like being buried or bricked up or in the yeah. dirt. Yeah, this this definitely sounds like she's upset that she's her body's been left, which I like that because it does sort of lend itself to them thinking that the body is the source. So maybe Lucy right. wasn't being completely idiotic later on. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so then eventually Lockwood does come out <laughs> into the hallway and be like, oh, I see you were actually, when you said it's urgent, you meant it. Though I, I don't yeah, think Yeah, and actually... she's like, she's mad at him. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is totally understandable, but also funny. I I really do love their dynamic of... of <laughs> It really feels in this these first couple of chapters that Lucy is the professional and Lockwood is just here to have a good time and show off. Yeah, yeah. He is messing around a little bit too much. So, yeah. So after after they rejoin and like Lockwood clues into reality, he doesn't let Lucy 
go after the ghost because she's upset. I think this is really important for, especially for the first book, but for the, just the idea of the world building and stuff Mm -hmm. that he's like, he tells her, you need to calm down. Um, She'll feed off your anger super fast and she'll grow strong, which is, I mean, that's just exposition, Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really well delivered because she is upset and this isn't like, he's not explaining something to her that she doesn't already know. He's reminding her and being like, this is why we have to be careful because like the ghosts feed on emotions and fear and anger seem to give them something and so like it just puts them in greater danger yeah and like i've been saying like the psychic battle of controlling yourself is a really really important part of the ghost hunting uh i also like that he kind of goads her into a bit of an argument not like an argument but like a tiff i guess and then yes and then to just to help get her get the anger out and, and they don't like say that on the page, but afterwards he's like, do you feel better now? And she's like, actually, yes. And that's yes, really I, smart I character work too. there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. It's really cute. Yeah. It's a, it's a good joke. Cause it, yeah. At the end he's like, how's your anger management going? Yeah. And she snorted and had to admit that she felt better. Yeah. I admit I'm annoyed, but now I'm annoyed with you. That's different. <laughs> That feels cute and good. And like, yeah. it's probably also like, I don't know. It, I don't, I don't read a lot of, if I'm honest, I don't read a lot of like romantic attraction between the characters in the first three books. Now that I've read the three books, but there, she is definitely like smitten with Lockwood in terms of like, she's captured by his charisma, like right away. And I think that you can kind of, read a sublimated like i'm angry with you as like that is easier psychically to deal with like you feel annoyed with somebody than admitting to yourself that you're attracted to them so you like the flirting is like "Ooh, i hate you kind of stuff that teenagers do because they can't deal with the alternative yes i you know it's interesting that you say that you don't think there's a lot of attraction between them in the first three books because you've you've brought that up before about how you don't think there was that much uh between them in the books but you've also said that in your real life you can never tell if somebody is flirting and i think about those two things a lot (laughs) a hundred percent i think i'm very bad at reading this kind of thing and it always like sometimes i'm reading a book and i feel annoyed like well where did this come from they would never showed any signs of being interested in each other because it's just not explicit enough for me. I can't like read the signs. So that's an, I will fully admit to that. Yeah. Um, so I, I do, I actually don't think that this bit is about attraction. I think it's just about, they have a good relationship. You know, they've been living together for six months. We don't know that yet in the book, but it's given them like a rapport. They know each other really well. Yeah. It definitely speaks to a history. And I do, I do think it's kind of cute. I, I don't even necessarily know if I mean that in a romantic way, but just when he says, how's your management going on, Luz? I could just see him like grinning at her like an idiot, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. So it's good. There's, um, there's a kind of cute joke that I like in Lucy's narrative voice mm-hmm. a little bit after that, once they get into the office and it talks about like how, There's geology magazines and there's maps all over the place and there's hammers. And she's like, I used my keen investigative instinct to tell me that Mr. Hope might possibly have been a geologist by tree. I was like, good, Lucy. I like, she's kind of sardonic about herself. Um, Oh, yeah. Which I actually love that because there's nothing that a teenager does better than like self-deprecating sarcasm. Yeah, yeah. And also just the way when they talk and how they're always kind of trying to one up each other. Like, yep, that <laughs> <laughs> Stroud just nailed what it is to listen to teenagers talk to each other. It's very charming to not have somebody who's like, yeah. she, like she's being ironic about it and not be like, I'm an amazing genius. Like that would be annoying or for her to be down on herself and be like, I'm so stupid. That would also be annoying. Oh, yeah. No, no. It's it. I don't even know how to describe it. It's the perfect self-deprecation because it's not. Yep. 
she doesn't wallow in it. She just says, well, that was stupid and moves on. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing. But then, yes, they go into a room, find an old chimney, and think there's probably something in there. Yep. And that's um, in the room and- that is a study now, but used to be a bedroom. And they think that Mr. Hope setting up his office in there is what set off the ghost after so much time. Yeah, Lockwood has a good Sherlock moment of being like, there was something on this carpet before. Yeah, that's a good moment for him, actually, because I do feel like (laughs) most of these opening chapters are Lucy kind of telling him he's dumb. Yeah. Yeah. Again, not in so many words, but like, don't do the accents. (laughs) Don't do this. Don't do that. Obviously, it's this. Blah, blah, blah. So when he does have a good, you know, oh, but there was obviously a bed here moment. It's like, okay, Lockwood does have a brain. Yeah, and she like kind of, <laughs> she kind of undercut him when he was being like a detective and like, I think someone else died here mm-hmm. um, because she just happened to be looking at the ghost. That was some real detective work on his part, some real brain work, but it just so happened it wasn't necessary. Did you have anything else for chapter three? No, I did want to, I did want to ask you, and I just always think this, I think this is, you know, training as like a, English major or whatever. It's something that I think about in any first person narrative is mm-hmm. like she's using the past tense here for everything. So we're not like, you know, I walked up the stairs and right. Anthony did this. It's it's all past tense. And so I always just ask myself, like, from what part of the future is this Lucy? writing and to who is this a written account or is this like is this anything you know like in the kind of like you know Bilbo Baggins wrote the story of the Hobbit and then that's what we're reading kind of a thing like right retrospective do you have any sense of how and maybe there's an answer to this in the because I haven't read all the books and there, there is isn't like, it's not no it's okay. it's just the style okay yeah And so my sense is that there isn't, I mean, even absent of you saying that, that this isn't like an account that she is constructing, that it's, it's just merely a delivery system and that he's not making more of it than that. Yeah, it it does because it is so almost conversational in, in times, like it kind of goes back and forth. Like sometimes it does feel like Lucy is talking directly to us and therefore it feels like Lucy is writing this or whatever Mm -hmm. but it also feels like in those moments in particular is when she feels the most teenager right because that's when she has her her quip so it doesn't feel like a later on lucy looking back i agree yeah that that is the sense that i get yeah there's there's no reflection exactly if you wanted to assign it something like in universe it would be journals i would say right yeah I think that that it like really speaks to what you pointed out in the show too, about how she records stuff for Nori yeah, and how that is a lot like the voice in the book, because that, that voice very much feels like situated in this moment and does not have like a lot of insight on herself. She's not like reflecting as an adult or anything. I don't know. That just felt like an important thing to think about at the beginning of the book and like having been informed by the other books, I was like, is there anything there? I don't, but I don't really think that there is. I don't think that there has to be. I don't think that that would no. make the book. It's not like better. It's not anything. like the outsiders, you know, when you get to the end and pony boy starts writing the beginning. Right, 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 right. That's a cute trick. There's, yeah. I don't know. There's other books where I like that, you know, that it's reflected and that there's, you know, that there is a perspective and all of that stuff that can give richness to it, but it, it's not necessary. And, um, and I think it's just the mode that he's, he, that he's writing. In. Yeah. I on, honestly, I think the choice in that is really just to give us humor through Lucy's voice, you know, and, and mm-hmm. world building and that sort of thing. Yeah. I think it also is good because it limits what we can know about the world to her perspective, which I think there's lots of advantages to that too. Oh yeah, absolutely. We've talked about this before. The books wouldn't work at all from Lockwood's perspective or if we got like Lockwood chapters or whatever, it just, it wouldn't, especially later on when the interpersonal drama becomes more of a thing 
Right. Not knowing is like really important yeah. for the drama of that yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So then chapter four, Lucy accidentally starts a fire in the house during a battle with the ghost and they have to jump out the window to escape. Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, so chapter four opens with just like two paragraphs of world building, which I have dubbed Sources 101. <laughs> yes, I I really, really like this. Um, the part that I highlighted, it says, but the essence of our role, the reason for our being is always the same to locate the specific place or object connected mm -hmm. to a particular member of the restless dead. Yeah, it's. It's great how she does give all this world building, but then says, and this is why we are here. And it's kind of like mm -hmm. the culmination of these first couple of chapters. Like, this is our job. What I really like about this is that the books, we're not trying to, like, figure out how to ghost hunt. Like, it is right here at the beginning of the first yes. book. It, yeah. It's already known how to do this. What these books are going to explore and Lucy's journey is, like, all about is something that I feel like this process is kind of suppressing and hiding from the ghost hunters. And it, and is like, it's systematized a thing to be like, don't think about what the sources are or how they operate. Like just learn how to hunt them down and like capture them and destroy them. Yes. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's do the process. Your whole job is to just be, an instrument of the process yep. and to not examine the process and the books are going to unlock all of that. Yeah. And not examine if there's a deeper thing going on. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. That's like the point, part of the point of the process, I guess is what I'm saying is to, to suppress that kind of like investigation. Yep. To kill the kids off too early and keep them too busy to worry about other things. Right. Um, yeah, I did, yeah, yeah. I did highlight a line here where Lucy is thinking, uh, we're too busy trying to avoid being ghost touched to worry about philosophy. And I just wrote, oh, sorry about that, Alan. <laughs> 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 I like that though. I, I feel like, um, yeah, I feel like Stroud is like literally kind of saying a thing here. Yeah. Like I'm not thinking deeply in certain ways about this. Like it's not, this is an adventure. It's not like a deep, I'm not. I'm not doing that. I'm doing something else. I always like that part. Yeah. And then we get a line about the sources most often. And then in brackets, it's like 73% of the time, according to research. And I'm like, I wonder how Stroud came up with the uh, 73%. <laughs> like, was it just random? <laughs> that a source is associated with what the Fitz manual calls personal organic remains. <laughs> Which is right, right, such right, a, right. a body. training yeah. manual way of saying like a dead body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's very technical. So it, it, yeah, it just gets rid of all the actual humanity. That's a good question. I wonder if like his house number growing up was 73 or something like that. Yeah. Or if he originally wrote down 75, but then was like, mm, that's too round of a number. Let's just say 73. Yeah. The publisher. Was yeah. Like, don't, don't do that. I was going to talk about the, the, she recognizes you're the weak one um, thing, but it, maybe you have something before that. Oh, I was just going to like summarize. They start breaking into the chimney to find the body that we talked about. Lucy does have this one line that says, you know, keep to the rules, keep ourselves safe, which I just highlighted as not so punk rock. <laughs> Very true. But then, yes, after that, Lockwood does have his, has, has that conversation that you just said. Yeah, he really steps in it, right? He's yeah. like, she recognizes the ghost that is, that you're the weak one. And Lucy's like, I'm sorry, what are you saying? What? And he's like, Luce, this isn't the time. I just mean emotionally. Like you're emotionally <laughs> the weak one. She's like, what? And that's better? I love, um, I, I love this idea that he's saying that the ghost is attached to her because she's the weak one, but like literally she's the only one who can communicate with the ghost. Like maybe that's yeah. why. <laughs> yeah. It's just, uh, it's, it's good. It's funny in the middle of this like pretty tense thing and kind of like gross, weird thing where they're digging in the wall and it like go, goes back to their dynamic, which is and, really good again. And they bring George into it too, even though he's not even here. So you can see that this is like a further conversation that they've been having at home, you know? 
yeah, yeah, yeah. She's like, yeah. She's like, is that a thing that George says? He's like, this has nothing to do with George. Um, yeah, exactly. But it also like brings up the whole thing that we talked about a little bit in the show of like how gender is like a dynamic of this whole thing, mm -hmm. which is also how this chapter opens where it talks about, although we don't really know that, but like with the fits and uh, I guess we do it, it name drops them, uh, specifically with their gendered names with, um, Fitz and Rotwell. With Maris Marissa Fitz and Tom Rotwell. Right. And so like that tells you that the most effective ghost hunting includes like a gender binary and that the and we can see here that the work itself the psychic work is gendered in some way and we've already had hints about this in the previous three chapters with the sight and the listening and all of that kind of stuff yes so, i mean we never i don't know some I do feel like some of this is because it's being written by a stodgy British man, you know, like. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think the gendering at all is like it comes from that. Yeah. yeah. I feel like if we asked Stroud about this directly, he would say, no, it's not gendered. Boys can be like this. Girls can be like this. But his like unconscious bias wrote it this way and that we never actually do meet a boy who's a listener. Right, right, right. Yeah. And that, yeah, that it constructs it in this way just automatically and the idea of gender not being a binary just never even comes up yeah yeah it can only be it can only be two people in this way and and that's how it is yeah i think all of that stuff is important and the way that like you know like lockwood did not come to this conclusion i feel like this is society has told him that like being a listener is emotionally weak and you know what i mean and that like to be female is to be vulnerable and weak and emotional and blah 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 and all these things that our society thinks about femininity mm -hmm. as well and so like all of that stuff is encoded there in that little exchange in like important ways that are yeah both unconscious and like i think he's playing with them and like you know talking about it and being like actually this is her secret weapon but like it also does play into the gender binary and, yeah, and as, ideas about yeah essential femininity. Uh, I I will th at the end of this conversation or a part of it, Lockwood does sort of bring up how you'd think she he says you'd think she'd want us to do this. You think she'd want to be found. Talking about the ghost wanting them to find the dead body, and I just think that that's an interesting line to give Lockwood because. As we see later, he doesn't care what ghosts want. He doesn't want to think about them as human beings or as things that used to be human beings. Oh, well, that's a good point. So it's, I have to assume that Stroud just wasn't thinking about that right here. Or maybe this is just luck. Or it's, it's probably not even that deep. But it's just interesting that he brought that up I, I, here. Yeah, I think he's complaining because he's yeah. having to do a lot of work. Yeah, <laughs> he's exactly. Like, he's why just is whining. she biting us? Why is she making it harder? But it's just interesting that it came up here. In yeah, yeah, yeah. I I noticed that too. Um, I agree. And then on the next page, the ghosts come back. The ghosts, the ghost comes back. Wow, I can't speak. And we finally get like a decent physical description of her. <sighs> Uh, which includes Lucy saying she looked like the kind of girl I'd always instinctively disliked. Soft and silly, passive when it mattered, and when it didn't, reliant on her charms to get her way. I hate everything about that. <laughs> I'm so glad that Stroud introduced the fact that Lucy hates girls early on. Sarcasm, mm -hmm. obviously. I just... <laughs> nothing would have changed... If he had just given her, given the ghost, those descriptions without Lucy having to say the kind of girl I'd always instinctively disliked, like we would have gotten it. Mm -hmm. I, just, I and and people I've seen people talk about that, like in world, there are reasons for Lucy to dislike other girls. Like there's, she's got six sisters and a mom who have not been great to her, and I get it. But out of world, this is still a choice that a male writer is making about a female main character that he is writing from the perspective of. And I hate that. I the Girls don't need to be, uh, I, the word escapes me, but they don't need to be mean to each other like this. There can still be tension mm -hmm. between them. Just anyways, we're going to revisit this a lot in book three, obviously, but 
I oh yeah yeah I hate it. It comes up all the time. Yeah, <clears throat> and I when hate it. yeah when I read this part, it felt very much as like the book or the story is judging this kind of femininity as yep. like intrinsically bad or dishonest. Yep. Like it's a it's a bad way to be a person. Um, that it does it come across me. that that's what Lucy feels. Yeah. That she thinks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in general, like she talks later about how she doesn't have, I don't even think it's in this book, but whatever, how she doesn't have many female friends and all that sort of thing. And I, I just want to know why Stroud made these decisions. Again, not in world. I don't care about the in world decisions. Why Stroud, as an external force, decided Lucy hates girls. Mm hmm. And I, I just hate it. I, so many of the scenes, so many of the conflicts could like, it could absolutely just be taken out that it's, and, and it would still work. Yeah. And it's like, what, and this was kind of related to the question that I was asking about perspective in the <clears throat> first person and all of that is that there's the, like no sense in which I guess what I mean it, if this had been written by an adult Lucy who was looking back and seeing like, if she instead said about this ghost and at that time in my life, these were all the things that I was scared to be as a woman. Yeah. That I was scared. I wasn't pretty enough that I was scared. I was too bold around Lockwood and, and that he didn't see me as a woman because of that. And you know what I mean? And that made me hate her. Um, there's no sense of that at all. There's just like an unironic, it, this kind of femininity is intrinsically bad and dishonest. Yeah. And so like that really like feels to me like a judgment that the book makes in the same way that when we get villainous characters who do bad things, the book is judging them and saying like this is a bad person like and this to be a woman who is passive at the right times and looks a certain way is bad like end of yeah. thing you know what it, i mean yeah that's like it's a, exactly it's bad. and in, in the context i i don't think Stroud meant it this way at all but in the context of when we're getting this it also kind of feels like and that's probably why she died yeah 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 it's part of her victimhood yeah, yeah. which is bullshit yeah, yeah, yeah. And I I don't I don't think my sense of Stroud is that he's not that kind of guy, but that it it's like you said about the other gendered things that this is just like the unconscious bias, you yeah. know. Un yeah, it's just in there. It's just or, programmed into you. Or it's like like Lucy is very much written like a teenage I'm not like other girls girl, which is fine. Mm -hmm. I'm 100% like that exists. I'm not trying to say that it, you shouldn't think that she shouldn't think that or anything like that, but he doesn't have the nuance for it mm -hmm. because there's so much more going on than, Oh, I hate other girls, blah, 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 blah. When, when you are a teenage girl. The other thing that I think uh, whenever this comes up a lot of times, and this might be totally unfair to Stroud and just might be me actually projecting myself onto him is that it's easier as a man who you know, like, I don't wear makeup. I don't have to deal with women's clothes. Right. To have a character who's like, I hate makeup. I dress different than other girls. I don't worry about girly things. Like, that is just easier to do as a man. Sure. And like, that would be fine. my experience. That would be fine. You can have a character saying, I prefer this. I prefer, and I don't prefer that. But then to actively think, I hate this. And I hate that. And I right, hate right, girls right. who do and like that. And that's, they're bad yeah. because they do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's where we have a problem. It's, it's, it's really bad. Though, again, yes, I do think all of this is unconscious on Stroud's. Like, I don't think he, like, there's a difference between somebody who actively hates women and somebody who's just not that great at writing them. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that Lucy would be the hero of the book. I don't think that she would be the kind of character that she is if he, like, actively... Yes. Hated women and like could, didn't understand yes. them at all. So that's yeah. that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying I think society is in his brain telling him things and that he lacks the nuance because he never was a teenage girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Not that it matters if I agree or not. <laughs> I do. 
Uh, so then they find a dead body in the wall, but that's normal for them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and they have a fight with a ghost. I didn't really take any notes here. It was all just like body I was fight. about to say that. Yeah. You know, they... the fight is good and it's, it's explained really well. It's easy to picture, mm -hmm. but I didn't take any notes uh, through it. The first note that I have in this whole section um, has to do with Lucy says, uh, a rush of pity filled my heart. Who did this to you? Right. Um, and that's like a really important turning point in the story and like begins us on the path of like what I talked about, like, that's not a question that you should be asking for the kind of fits manual, how to hunt ghosts. That's yeah. never something that you need to ask yourself. You should never put yourself in the perspective of the dead person. Yes. Um, I, I did also write down cause Lockwood calls out plan E and I just wrote down, I like that joke better in the show. Yeah. 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 Cause they had the, the follow through with it. Um, but yeah, no, I mentioned that line also the pity because it's, <laughs> I like that you're saying that this is a choice that Lucy is making um, to actively think in a way that, you know, the Fitz manual probably does not encourage. While I was like, I wonder if this is her, her making a connection with the ghost and the ghost kind of forcing her to think that way. Forcing oh, isn't the right word, but like the ghost being no, like, could I get you what care you mean. about me, please? Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. That's no, I, I don't know which one it would be. A bit of both, maybe. But yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, even if the ghost is doing that, it still has to be an act of choice on her part to, you know, go in that direction because that's what we've been talking about. Like yeah. there's all the psychic battle that happens internally. And so this is a choice. And this, I think, is when she reaches in to take the necklace. And yeah, yeah. which is why the ring in the show was such a better choice because she could just grab it. In this one, I'm left thinking, did she just rip it? Did did she reach behind the late the and unclasp? <laughs> and then she decapitated. Oh God! Oh, <laughs> like either option is bad. Yeah. Like, did she just hug a dead body? You know, like. Ugh. Yeah, it's like the thing that I thought of when I watched it in the show was um, it probably no one thought of this, is like Galadriel giving her hair to Gimli. Oh and yeah. And how like, that's really beautiful in the book, but then when if you try to do that on screen, it would be like. What's even happening? What is she giving him? I can't even see anything there. Yeah. And then like, um, what does he do with it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where is it? It's really dumb, but it looked, it works really well on the page. Like I totally buy that she's able to get this necklace and everything. Cause you don't, you just don't have to think about it and it just happens. But I don't know if you have I've to thought film about that, it too like... much. Now I don't, I can't picture anything other than her reaching around the dead body to get to the clasp. And I'm just like, it's oh, bad. But through the silver net and stuff, it's like really weird. It's awkward. Yeah. Um, but then the whole house is on fire. And I know like Lockwood does get ghost touched here, but I couldn't find a moment where it happened. Did I was looking for this too. Yeah. And uh, I missed it. And he seems, I don't know, like jokey and with it still all the way to the end of the chapter. And so I was like, did it happen after she fell? No, because the... So I don't know. Well, I was going to say because the net's already on the dead body, but we are we know that that doesn't matter. Right. I, I, I don't know when it happened. It's interesting. There didn't seem to be a moment, so I guess it was just while he was distracting the ghost. Mm hmm But yes, the house is burning down, so they got to jump. But before they can jump, there's kind of an explosion. Or not an explosion, but like a piece of the house kind of pushes Lucy out. Yeah, it's collapsing. Yeah. She falls out, which is another super strong ending to the chapter, to the part one. Yep. You just want to keep reading. I did want to talk a little bit about metals and like folklore. Go ahead. Because like, I, I appreciate that Stroud like throws in all kinds of stuff that it's not like he made it up or is just picking arbitrarily, but they come from like real you know, kind of like supernatural lore in the culture. So like, I don't know if people know that silver has actual antimicrobial properties. Like it's been lab tested. Microbes just don't like growing on silver. It's just a thing. Chemically, it doesn't work out. And so like ancient people just noticed that if you had water in silver cups or silver pitchers, 
that the water wouldn't get rancid and gross. And so there's ascribed kind of magical properties to the silver. Like, obviously, the demons and ghosts aren't, you know, making you sick because they're afraid of silver, obviously. Um, cause and effect. And so silver just kind of takes on a magical quality in stories because of that. And interesting. Like, oh, are you saying something? It just, I just, I, I had never really heard that about silver before, but I have noticed that silver comes up a lot in fiction. Yep. I don't think that people even know anymore that there's a, you know, connection there to like the ancient Greeks had silver mines all around Athens and stuff. And so they use silver for like their plates and silverware and, Mm -hmm. you know, cups and stuff. And they would get, sick less often than other people and there was also all the greek philosophers and like aristotle you know doing biology in the ancient world and stuff and so they just figured this stuff out and and then other people who didn't have these advancements saw that stuff about their culture and they're like oh well that's clearly because silver is magical you know like that's why it does that um and then that just gets folded into your storytelling and then people forget why i was gonna make a stupid joke about how i think i've infiltrated some of those mines in assassin's creed (laughs) Um, those battles are bullshit down there yeah um and then iron is kind of the same thing like working with iron is really really hard because to get it hot enough to work with it will usually melt the forge of people you know or tools that you need to to uh get it molten like you can't even once it's molten it's going to melt anything that you try to do with it so like it's impossible to work with and so how did people make iron anything in those other cultures if you're not a part of that culture and don't know those secrets it's obviously magic so like iron tools and stuff are magical just intrinsically that's interesting because in 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 this story and in most stories where iron is part of a thing The whole point of it is that it's anti-magical. Right, 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 right. Like it stops. It has some kind of stopping magical things. I think also magnetism has to do with um, iron's magical, like the lore around it. And if you think about, you know, positive to positive, they kind of push against each other. And so maybe that is kind of like, well, the iron's magical and the fairy's magical. And that's why they don't go together. You know what I mean? Maybe. But or even just like you were saying, it's so hard to work with that maybe that's why they might think that it could be repellent. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. That connection makes sense in my brain. I don't I don't think I made it clear in the words that I spoke, but whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So during when we did our episodes on the show, we had a most punk rock moment, which I do think we're planning to continue but we're also going to add a best and or worst joke from every section yeah or we're gonna try to i don't know i don't know how this will go yeah uh i guess please send us your feedback on whether or not this is good and also whether or not in general we were kind of boring this time i don't know i feel like maybe we were so what was your best and or worst joke Hmm. i think my favorite joke is the is the old lockwood Oh, whole thing. Yeah. I'm just scanning through all the jokes that I, I highlighted jokes. And I think that's my favorite one. It, it actually makes me laugh through the whole, like I'm just chuckling through the whole thing. I did like, there's another joke that I like where, <laughs> where they're like walking down a hallway and Lucy's like pretty tense. Mm-hmm. And it says, Lucy, look. Lockwood's voice. Oh, that one, yeah. There's Mr. Hope. (laughs) It's just like a picture of him. And she's like, and Mrs. Hope's here as well. I do, I do love Lockwood being a shit. Yeah. (laughs) It's good. I wrote down my favorite joke being everything, basically from receptionist George and onward on that page. I love when Lucy's just like, Are you ready? And he's like, Yes, I'm moving shape. And, yeah, yeah, and, she and just then does like it so it very like yep, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. And then they talk about it a little bit more, and we also get like some world building in that about how adults can't really see or sense. And I just really True, liked yeah. that. Yeah, 
And then it like goes on for a bit while they still just like like give Mrs. Hope shit basically. It's great. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very like on the job energy. Yeah. Like, can you believe the client bullshit? You know? Yeah. And that's I, a good one. I still remember the first time like listening to the audiobook when they like the first time I heard it and I did chuckle out loud. It was good. It was well done. Uh I did write down a worst joke, which I thought at one point Lucy brings up Lockwood getting shut in a bathroom on a job. And then he's like, it was the ghost. I didn't just get locked in there. And I don't know. I thought that was <laughs> stupid and unnecessary. There weren't any sometimes Stroud. And I'm sure I will highlight these. He just does like a groaner to me that I'm like, yeah, oh, man, I can't believe you did that. They're never ja dad jokes, but they're like as bad. I don't know. We'll get to them. Um, for most punk rock, I put uh the stealing of the necklace. Oh, that's a good one. Because she yeah. kind of goes back for it, you know, like the 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 net is on, they can get out, and she's like, mm, but I need to steal this jewelry, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like that. Yeah, I just had them jumping off the roof that like or whatever. Then it's not the roof, but like they're high up. And Lockwood's like, well, this is the way we got to go. But it's not very punk rock, honestly, because it's like they don't have a choice. Yeah. That's the whole point. It's that or die. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, before I thought of the necklace, I think that was going to be mine, too. Because jumping out of a burning building that you set on fire, that is kind of a little punk rock. It's very cool. Yeah. yeah. But it's not very, like, down with the system, man. Like, we didn't, you know, jump off the roof and throw the grenade in the building. Like, yeah. Fuck them. It wasn't that. But I guess it was um, like Lucy sets the house on fire because she does decide that her and Lockwood surviving is more important than following the rules. So mm -hmm. that could be punk rock. It's a little bit. Yeah. So next time we'll read part two titled Before. Yeah. Like, like I said, this is kind of a new format for us. So if you have any feedback, please do reach out to us. It would make sense for me to then go into our collective uh, contact info, but that's just not how we do things. So I'm going to say you can follow me on Twitter at yeah. Inferior Caitlin. Right. So just send it right to Caitlin. Yeah, just send it. No, you can follow the show on Twitter. It's not Twitter anymore. Oh, whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's X. I forgot about that. You have that. to say it like, it makes me so ashamed of my generation because I am Generation X. I'm like the very tail end of Generation X. And I hate how it's like, it's SpaceX and it's Twitter X. And it's, dude, and you're the worst of our generation, honestly. Stop it. So you can follow the show on Twitter at Lockwood Podcast. <laughs> and if you want to reach out in an email, you can do that. I never ever read this line. And you can tell. Yep. To You can email us at. I'm not helping you. No, you're not. This is, you did this. You're in it. If you want to reach out you by email, you can send one to contact at hallowedgroundmedia.com or visit our contact page, which Alan did not write down here. That's right. Good luck finding it. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, Celsius is better than Fahrenheit. I'm Caitlin. I'm, <clears throat> yeah, that's who I am. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I have one line. <clears throat> Good. And drink some, drink some tea. No, oh, sorry. <clears throat> Good. All right. <laughs> I'm Alan. And this week we are. I don't know. Just leave all that in there. <laughs> 
terrible. No, no, I'll I'll do a I'll do an outtake at the end. It'll be good. 